God uh, and taking uh, his academic discipline of archaeology serious uh, and finding a way uh, to uh, put these two together. Um, so it's, it's been challenging and, and interesting and uh, I think advantageous for, for me personally and I hope it has been for you as well. So uh, we, we're come here for our, our last session and uh, we will uh, receive Dr. Ortiz with uh, generous hearts and, and open ears. If you need some caffeine and uh, to the afternoon time, sometimes a little more challenging uh, to stay focused, um, but we'll give our best attention uh, to our time today. And so, Dr. Ortiz, um, we just welcome you back to the podium today. Enjoying the sweet fellowship and uh, the debates with Old Testament faculty. I say Old Testament faculty, this is Dr. Peacock and myself as we <laughs> engage with um, uh, everything that's going on. And uh, we pretty much solved all the Baptist politics and things within this afternoon. So uh, uh, we're, almost, we're almost finished. And he said, aren't you speaking a little bit? And so I go, oh, I better run up. And so uh, Archaeology of David and Solomon. Speaking of politics, we'll go back to um, the biblical texts and some of the issues uh, David and Solomon is a hot topic. There are so many books on David. Uh, the storyline leads itself to literary uh, reconstructions, uh, uh, a lot of archaeological data that's allowed for these reevaluations, and um, even uh, within scholarship, there's been a lot of debate on the nature of state development, the nature of this social transformation from Joshua and Judges, these small villages, uh, to the um, kingship of David. Um, a lot of social scientific models, especially in the 80s, uh, discussing how um, states are formed and how we can look at this, um, some of the sociological developments, and here's several models there. Uh, but also you have critical scholars uh, wondering whether um, a history of Israel can be written, whether David is this a fictitious king, just like King Arthur and you know um, some of the myths around uh, some of these individuals. Um, the accounts of David have type of a folkloric or mythological character. Uh, David defeats the giant, and even artists reconstruct some of these images here. And uh, here's my favorite one, you know. Like a football player, I got plenty of water. No, I got water here. Thank you. Um, I'm like a football player, you know, I, I conquered it. And uh, but the question I want to discuss this afternoon is: Are these just historical or mythological stories? Earlier on in, in biblical archaeology, up uh, this was published in the '90s, and notice it's a joint publication by Israel Finkelstein and Nadab Nauman, uh, Tel Aviv University, and. They're writing these articles, this is an uh, edited book, but from nomadism to monarchy, archaeological and historical aspects of early Israel. And so 1990s, Israel Finkelstein believed in this transition, and he might not have had a high view of the Bible, but he believed in the background, the historicity of it. And archaeologists were busy uh, trying to reconstruct the past. Um, and define the nature of the sociological change. Several publications also had this general consensus. Uh, so if we weren't sure about the patriarchs, if the exodus might be myth, if we're debating, and I'm speaking as a critical scholar, uh, Joshua and Judges, David is historical, and that's the, the line most secular scholars drew. So even my doctor father, you know, when I went to school, graduate school, you know, David's real. That's when history begins. Everything beyond that, it, it starts to fade. Um, a general consensus, uh, I've been part of this consensus. Most of my writing has been on uh, the archaeology of David and Solomon, the history of David and Solomon. And um, needless to say, this is somewhat of a love of mine. Well, not a love. I, my dissertation was over this, and then I just got stuck with doing it. So that's, I fell, fell into it, but naturally anything biblical um, uh, I have a passion for. I mentioned William Foxborough Albright, father of biblical archaeology. Uh, he redated the conquest of the 13th century. 
Uh, also at Talbot Mirsim, he established the archaeology of David and Solomon. He noticed that every city where we were that dated to the time of David, we had this special type of pottery, this red slave burnished pottery. And archaeologists, this is what we use for dating. We don't find coins like the New Testament. Uh, we, we have to get pottery and we can see this transition. And this became the diagnostic feature. So everyone who would go out and dig, you dig this level, you find this red slip burnished pottery, you go, okay, I'm in the 10th century somewhere. Beneath that, there's not as much red slip, and that's the time of Joshua and Judges. And I, that's a caricature of, you know, I'm summarizing uh, ceramic analysis. But on the other side, you have Yigo Yadin, uh, Israeli archaeologist. He's considered the father of Israeli archaeology. Key figure in the archaeology of David and Solomon, he excavated at Hatzor. And at at Hatzor, he found a six-chambered gate. Now, the Germans at the turn of the century, about 1910, excavated Megiddo. And they also found a unique gate system. I'm going to show you some diagrams soon. And Yadin remembered this biblical text. Now, this is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon levied to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, uh, the wall of Jerusalem, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. And Yadin said, you know what, I think I have evidence for the six-chamber gate at Hatzor, at Megiddo. Gezer was already excavated by um, uh, 19, from 1902 to 1911 by McAllister, and McAllister found what he called a Maccabean castle. And so you can see this is the, ca- the castle. Well, these are casemate walls, typical of an Israelite city. And archaeology wasn't as defined when McAllister was excavating. And Yadin said, you know what? I think McAllister actually has a six-chambered gate. You have one chamber here, a second chamber there, and a third chamber. Now, what we've learned is that this um, Solomonic gate was reused in the Hellenistic period. So McAllister was right. They just used the stones. Uh, but all of a sudden, Yadin said, I remember this one text. For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer and the lower Beth Horon. And 19, 1970s, my doctor father, Dr. William Deaver, goes back, excavates Gezer, and sure enough, we find the six-chamber gate. So we dig the other side. And so now all of a sudden, you have the classic textbook case of biblical archaeology, evidence of Solomon's building projects. Now, we have no, again, no graffiti, um, no uh, plate, dedicated to Solomon and the Southern Baptists of Texans who built this, or men, whoever built, I was just reading your outside, you know. Um, but what it shows is there's some type of centralized authority. At least we can say this is the same construction company that built this architecture. And we know where the construction company came from, the Phoenicians, and the Bible mentions that. And so it's all fitting together, and you go like, look, this is the best fit. This is the United Monarchy. This is some centralized authority coming in and reestablishing these fortress cities. And so the Bible, granted, is summarizing the highlights of what David did. You know, okay, you build the capital, you establish Jerusalem, uh, you have some uh, uh, local works within the capital, and then where he built outside. So Hatzor up in the north, Megiddo to control the Jezreel Valley, and then Gezer guards the pass up to Jerusalem. And so this makes sense. Um, this became the standard. Every, every biblical archaeologist was taught this. But then all of a sudden, after um, the late 90s, 2000s, Israel Finkelstein comes along and takes the critique in a new arena. Um, uh, instead of denying that David existed, uh, he proposed that we're misstating everything. And so he pushes, it's called the low chronology. So all that red slip pottery, 
goes to the ninth century. And then what's below it? All the villages that we discussed this morning of the Joshua and Judges. And so David really isn't a king of these large, massive gates. David is really the king of the small villages. And so you can just see shifting the archaeology changes the whole historical reconstruction. And so David becomes a king of a secondary state. Uh, we have our dating wrong. And uh, so the biblical text is trying to create this glorious past. David was just one of these smaller kings, tribal leaders, um, that eventually his son and grandchildren came to power in Judah in the ninth century. And they wanted to you know, create a, a, a good story of their grandfather, who was the tribal leader. And they created all these accounts. And, and that's the basic debate going on right now between you know, David and Solomon, between crit critical scholars. Um, question is, uh, can we have a crisis of methodology? I mentioned the first lecture, the nature of biblical, of archaeological data, how it's interpreted, how it's fragile, how, you know, not that we're guessing, but we're developing the chronologies. And the question is, can we have two archaeologists that look at the same material culture and come up with two different answers? Can we miss the state by 100 years? Uh, are we creating archaeology in the image of the text? I.e., Steve, do you want to believe the Bible so much that you're going to interpret what you find to coordinate with the Bible? Or else, is Finkelstein right and everybody else is wrong? Uh, I talked about a straw man uh, argument. What they will come up and say is Finkelstein will say, yeah, but in the, these 10th century cities, at Khatsor, Megiddo, Gezer, do we really find any state documents? If you're going to have a kingdom, you have to have bureaucracy. And we really don't find any bureaucracy. There should be, you know, scrolls with, you know, all these um, administrative texts. In the 8th century in Jerusalem, we find them. We have the bullae. Okay. Now, we don't have the scrolls. I mean, the scrolls were round up, tied, and they put, you know, clay, and they put the signet ring, and we, the signet ring burns in a fire, basically baking that seal, and we find all these seals. And some of them, we have the scribe that's, that are mentioned in later, you know, Second Kings. We don't find any royal seals. Here's a seal of Shema found from Megiddo at a later period in the Iron Age too. Well, why does Ahab, Omri, all these later kings have their nice seals and David doesn't have a, a pin? He was the great king. We don't find anything with David on it. But we find a lot of other kings of ancient Israel. We have a lot of battles. Uh, Mernaphtasela. Why, if David was a mighty king... Shouldn't we find some type of monument? You know, a Civil War monument with David on a horse and, you know, the head of Goliath or something. There should be statues glorifying this king. Uh, we have it in others. The Egyptians put up all these stelas. The Assyrians put up monuments to themselves. We don't have anything from David. Well, all of a sudden, 1993, this changed. We don't have a stela of David but we have a stella of the Aramean kings. And the Aramean kings come down and they destroyed the city of Dan. They conquered it. Dan's up north. And they wanted to brag about conquering Dan. And this dates to the ninth century. Now, in the ninth century, Ahab was the king and then Omri and the Omri dynasties. And you go like, okay, well, these are the kings up north. But he doesn't mention their names. The father of my household invaded Israel before he slept with his ancestors. Then the king of Israel invaded the land of my father. And Hadad, my divine patron, made me king with Hadad riding before me. I marched out of my land and destroyed 70 rulers with their corpse of chariots and horsemen. I put, and it's broken, but we think Jehoram, son of Ahab, 
and ruler of Israel, and Ahu, but we did Ahaziah, which is probably, you know, we're looking at the historical sources, the biblical sources. Son of Jehoram and ruler of the house of David. I put them to death. I destroyed their cities and left their lands barren. Now, David's already dead in the ninth century. The house of David really doesn't exist. Uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam divide up the land, and we have the divided kingdoms. And so during the ninth century, United Monarchy, David and Solomon aren't there. So this Aramean ruler conquers the northern tribes. In the biblical text, we have the, the Arameans are going back and forth. They're fighting you know, in the north, and uh, we have alliances. So if you're an Aramean king, and you want to brag about this battle, the memory of the house of David is so great that in Israel, they're referencing, I destroyed David's house. Not that I destroyed Ahab's, the house of Ahab. I'd rather choose that ruler. And so it's even, it gives even more credence to the historicity. This Aramean ruler isn't banking off this myth. He's writing this stella, and he places it at the city gate of Dan to let the Israelites know that he's ruler over them. And then this city, this um, stella is destroyed, in the later 8th century, they break it in pieces and they put it in the courtyard. That way, every Israelite that's walking through the city is um, defaming, is stepping on this stella. And that's how archaeologists found it. Um, it. They were always walking over it. Tourists were walking at Tel Dan, probably walking over the pieces of the stella. And after three or four seasons of rain up north, it washes the stones and one staff member of the site was there just taking measurements. And she sat down and she saw writing sticking out of the, um, the cobble surface there. And then this was assembled, put together. Um, we can connect it with some of the history of the northern kingdoms. And so now for the first time, we actually have proof. I mentioned graffiti. <laughs> it's another uh, king putting the house of David there. Um, so you can see, illustrating the debate, it's what I've talked about, this deductive approach. And they've set up this straw man argument. Here's everything we should find. Here's the shopping list if David existed. And I'm saying that archaeology doesn't work that way. We have fragments of evidence, and we have to reconstruct it. And even this stella doesn't necessarily date to the time of David, but it gives hints of... Uh, this king actually existed. Uh, we're going to go through our layers of scripture and go down and now the historical evidence. Again, we're, we're placing everything within this larger historical context. We have the collapse of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the great kings of Egypt fall. They're no longer in the land. Um, uh, Merneptah comes through and he's the last gasp. And all of a sudden this vacuum is created. And the Philistines were first to establish some type of um, polity, of strength. The Israelites were still villagers. They still were under a tribal leadership authority. And somewhere in the book of Samuel, we get a hint. They're saying, you know, we'd rather be a root under a king. We, and we know the story of Samuel. We want to be like the Philistines. They're so organized. They have a military. Their streets are, you know, set up nicely. And David's kingdom is just part of this power vacuum left in the Iron Age 1 period, in Iron Age 2 period. Uh, we talked about settlement data, demographic shifts, all these small villages. Uh, here was the one I thought I was this morning looking at. Uh, I've showed you the growth. Boom, this monarchy. Where'd all these? This is the state of David. This is when Judah and Israel are these secondary states. Granted, they're not as big as Egypt, but they're strong enough to control this land bridge. And the chart I showed you that all of a sudden it shifted, and we have all new settlements. And here you can see Iron Age 1. Here's how Israelites gathered, built their cities. Philistines are different. And then Iron Age 2, boom, we start to get organized structures and cities. Um, I like this one. This one's down in Beersheba. It's not uh, perpendicular streets, 
but because it's in the desert and water management becomes such a strong aspect of city development, when, when it rains, everything comes in this teardrop and it slopes down to one little corner. And in that corner, we have a large water system. So they even designed their streets that when it rained in the desert, it all goes to one corner and they have this water catchment. Uh, that's centralized authority. That's if somebody, you cannot raise the level of the street because you would, you know, it, it, the water will pull another, uh, into another region. So, so when we look at the settlement data, social transformation, even in the plans. And again, archaeologists, it'd be nice if we had records, but all we have is shifts in city planning. And this also, um, what we thought earlier, nomads becoming a monarch. Several tribes slowly developing into a centralized state. Uh, state formation. Well, what are components of a state? Taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, things haven't changed. And so that's what archaeologists are doing. So when we look at the landscape, we see evidence of a state development. We have fortifications, fortified cities. We, we have forts, we have uh, military structures, uh, monumental buildings. Uh, this is a, a reconstruction of Gezer and um, proto aeolic capitals. These are royal architecture. We find some in Jerusalem, uh, one supposed to be found in Gezer. We have them up at Megiddo. This is not a a small little tribe. And to, um, const to build this, somebody needs to be a stonemason. Somebody's full-time job is to sit there and just make massive pillared buildings. This is imitating what they see in Egypt. Egypt has these grand pillars and these large buildings. So you want to imitate other states. So you create your own royal architecture. Uh, for the first time, we have government buildings, palaces. Uh, this is, um, we see this all over the land, these redistribution. Uh, pillared storehouses, stables, or debate among archaeologists. You have a pillared structure in various side rooms. Sometimes we find mangers in these buildings, and hence, while well, these have to be stables, and it looks like horse stables, like the horses can be lined up. Uh, now it looks like these are multi use buildings. Sometimes they're markets. Sometimes uh, up in Megiddo, they might be used for uh, with, with stables because we have some parade grounds. Uh, I, I like to think of a market, uh, and it's not necessarily horses, but a donkey. So you have to pay your taxes to the temple and to the palace. But you're not going to go all the way up to Jerusalem. Well, they, they put a distribution center nearby. And so we have these all over the kingdom. You come in with your donkey. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, currency at this time. What do you bring? Well, I'm a, I grow wheat. So 10%, I'm going to bring eight jars, eight store jars of wheat and give it to the king. And you, t you strap these store jars to your donkey. You come through. The donkey eats in the manger and... Some government official unloads the donkey and counts and says, okay, um, Eliezer, you've given your taxes for this year. See you next year. Uh, these become storehouses for the king. Uh, they're used for military. And when we plot them out, we see that they're distributed in various areas. Hence, some type of centralized authority where you have to go to get your, you know, um, pay your taxes. I just got my COVID test. I'm negative, but I want to travel tomorrow. But again, I, I do a Google search. Where are all these government affiliated places? And I see a Google map of where I'm supposed to go. I mean, you guys did it for me, but you know, it's, uh, you can look around. Well, same thing. You have a government, you create this bureaucracy, you create various centers, and same thing in the ancient world. City planning, here's that teardrop city I talked about in Beersheba. Well planned, and it has, you come to the gate, it has these pillared structures. So you come in and you pay your taxes and you go back to your village. 
Uh, this is uh, Meg uh, Megiddo, large palace, several palaces here. Uh, if you're a king, you have a capital. You should have evidence of a massive capital. And what's the capital of David? Jerusalem. This is the city of David, and you build a temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we have no evidence for a 10th century building in Jerusalem. We have no evidence of the temple during Solomon's time. And so a lot of Old Testament history books write that. There's no archaeological evidence for David, therefore he doesn't exist. Uh, shouldn't we have evidence in Jerusalem? Well, there's a problem with um, Jerusalem. One, it's a living city. Where can archaeologists dig in all this city? This is in Gezer where it's out in the field, and we can spend 10 years going back every summer and exposing the gate system. Basically, you have to go to somebody's house and say, oh, we're going to bulldoze our house because I want to find David. And it's just not good, you know, relationships with the state of Israel to go destroy somebody's house. Um, it's a sacred city. This is the holy city. You just can't go in there and, you know, uh, blow up the Dome of the Rock and say, we're evangelical archaeologists. We want to show that David uh, um, and Solomon built a temple. Uh, It'll cause a little problems there if you do that. <laughs> Although there's been some crazies that have tried that. You know. um, but we have enough pieces of the archaeological data that we can reconstruct um, what we know about J Jerusalem during the 10th century. Uh, several articles have been written. Uh, there's been, particularly recently, because there's been a lot of uh, rebuilding in Jerusalem, that we're, we're having a lot of data there. Uh, this is this little ridge here is Old Testament Jerusalem this is the time of David this little sausage shape um, oh, here's an area of it and then you have the temple mount that was built up north the, the threshing floor of Aruna that um, David purchased for the temple. This is about 10 acres. I don't know how big your property is, but like 114 acres here. Basically, your, I don't want to say little seminary, but little seminary is, you know, 10 times bigger than the mighty state of Jerusalem, the capital of Jerusalem. And most Westerners, we, we have a misperception. We, you know, we New York, Calgary is a big city, you know. Um, it's probably the, you know, the extent of your buildings here. Um, and I'm not good at, at acreage, but it's small. And it was only um, enlarged because of the temple area. So now we have a small footprint to even search for the archaeology of Jerusalem. Gezer is a 33-acre site. And so the capital is only one-third of it. Nevertheless, whenever there's a plumbing line or a little sewer or anything archaeologists can dig, they've done it. So you can see where they've just, you know, little pieces where they've opened up on the city of David. And um, just most recently, in the past 10, 15 years, uh, we've had some major shifts in our understanding. Uh, we have this uh, Gihon Spring, we have a tunnel. Those who've traveled there, you've gone through Hezekiah's tunnel. Um, we've always wondered what was the water tunnel that David's men climbed up to open up the gate. Well, it's somewhere associated here. Uh, and what we found out is that this water system goes all the way to the time of Abraham. Uh, and recently we've just realized that the city is more complex. And here you can see some reconstructions of the water bringing it into the city. Another aspect, we've, um, there's been a lot of press on the palace of King David. Uh, truth be told, we have not discovered a palace of King David. Um, uh, Elat Massar is a, a great archaeologist. Uh, this uh, is um, 
I'm not saying she's wrong, but again, it's interpretation. What we found is a large stone structure. We've always known about this, and we've excavated on top of this stone structure. Now, keep in mind, Jerusalem's only 10 acres. So whenever you have a new king that wants to rebuild on Jerusalem, you have to destroy the top. There's just no place to expand. And so Jerusalem is difficult because everybody's always cleaning, you know, cleaning off the top. So you have just more flat area to build. Uh, so here you have um, an Old Testament structure. And this is a Roman wall built right on top of it. And they're, they're contemporary because Elo Capitolina, it's like how to build on top. There's no expanding the space. You can't expand, you just go down. During the time of the 8th century when Jerusalem grew, uh, we can see that people left the top and they started to build on the side of the hill. And this is where we found these bullae. And so Elat Mazar excavates on top of the hill and finds a palace. A large, you know, public structure. And here's parts of the structure here, sitting on top of the stone structure. Uh, and today you can go there. You pay your, buy your ticket. It's all covered up. I mean, they, they have a, a upper floor and a second floor, so you can go under. And, and have you guys gone? To, yeah, um, there. Uh, so here she is standing on bedrock. Top of the mountain has bedrock. You want strong foundations. You always have to clear it out. What Elot found is pottery dating to the 10th century beneath this 9th century palace. And so the implications are this is where the palace of David will be located. So you had the palace of David there in the 10th century. Later on the 9th century, um, kings after Rehoboam wanted to update it, remodel it, they had to build on top. So they would have destroyed it, used some similar walls, and then built that on, right on top. And so that's where we're saying this has to be the palace of King David. Uh, we do know that we have 10th century, um, this large stone structure dates to the 10th century. And so there has to be a 10th century building built on top. Um, you just wouldn't build, this is a massive earth project to keep the um, side of the slope from eroding. It also hints that you have some type of structure up there in terms of engineers that has a lot of weight on this side of the slope. And so you want, you know, uh, uh, support for that structure. Uh, that structure is missing, but we have the foundation. And so again, uh, pieces of evidence to show that some large building was built up here. Um, uh, and you, know, you can't tell tourists, um, pay 100 checks to go see a 9th century palace that's built over what we think is David's palace. So you just say, you're going to go see David's palace. And so that's, uh, uh, it made all the news. And so some archaeologists will say it's not really 10th century. But most now acknowledge that this historical re reconstruction is accurate. And so it's not debated anymore. Um, uh, and then also, you know, uh, we have some southern wall excavations. Elat Mazar has also excavated these southern wall excavations on the Opal Hill. And what she's found is a large type of gate structure. And this is probably the Opal Hill um, going right up to the temple. So here's where David's palace would be. And just north of it would be another fortress or an Acropolis. Normally in a city, the Acropolis is where the king lives and you have the king's palace. But who's the real king of Jerusalem? Yahweh. So the Acropolis, this leads up to where the temple is located. And then who's next in line after Yahweh? Well, God's chosen the king. And so south of the gate, you build the king's palace. And we even know, you know, when we look at the text, Solomon built, spent so many time, years building the temple, and he built, took twice as long to build his house. Um, 
which is even the problems with our churches. We spend more time building our churches than doing the gospel, but I'll let you all debate that with <laughs> Dr. Peacock. So, you know, that's all Baptist issues. Um, same thing with Solomon's temple. There is no archaeological evidence for Solomon's temple. Um, uh, we should not find any. It was destroyed. The Babylonians came and destroyed it. We don't have any evidence for New Testament temple during the time of Jesus. Um, and you know what's funny is that's one prophecy that Jesus said, not one stone will remain atop the other. And in 70, we shouldn't find it. And I know people go to churches and raise money to go find the temple. And I'm going to just read your Bible and you, you don't spend the $10. It's, you know... <laughs> But what we can do is comparative analysis. And temples have shifted over time. And so when we do a comparative analysis, we have the biblical text, a great description. It's a tripartite temple. You have various reconstructions here. And this is just a simple archaeological textbook of architecture. When you're teaching students the, the plans of temples. Here you have, during the time of Abraham, Migdal Temple, basically square-shaped. You just have a central uh, area for the deity, and you have like a little porch area. And then uh, sometimes it's a single one, Migdal temples, Migdal temples, and then all of a sudden they start to get elongated and divided up. And then th this is Solomon's temple, so this, this is not um, found anywhere. But we can look at this style and realize this tripartite temple starts about the 13th century and goes into the 10th century. Later on, we have Persian temples. They're square-shaped. They go back to a, a, a box-shaped type of temple plan. And biblical scholars don't know this, and when they say the Bible was invented during the Persian period, and that's when it was written. So if you have a Persian um, scribe that's or a priest that's inventing this story and Ezra and Nehemiah come back we come back to Jerusalem and let's write a great book of our history and you're going to spend a whole you know book of kings describing the temple you're going to describe this type of temple because for 600 years we never had tripartite temples they went out of use now, again, this one continued to 586, so, you know, um, um, the Jerusalem temple. So we know how temples look. When we go up to Syria, we have all kinds of tripartite temples, and they match the Solomonic temple. And these all date to the 10th century. And so we go up north to a Muslim country, look at the temples of the 10th century, and we can, they're just like the tripartite Solomon's temple. Uh, here's an entry area for the people. Here's a court for the priests to do the rituals and do various um, abulations or whatever and, and offerings. And then we have where the deity resides. Tau Tayanat, Dara. Some of these are massive. I like this one. This is like, um, probably like two two feet, um, uh, you know, two-thirds of a meter. And it's the footprints of the God. And so they want to say, okay, well, here's where God, you know, the deity, the, um, you know, probably Baal in Syria there. Uh, and great orthostats. Um, different than Solomon's temple. But again, if you look at the reconstruction based on the biblical text, they're describing a temple that dates to the 10th century. So I either have to say this is something authentic, or if they're writing during the Persian period, they're great archaeologists because they went and excavated 10th century temples and they, they recreated the text based on this. Um, border between Judah and Philistia. I want to talk about David's expansion. Um, this is Philistia. Azekah is a Judite city. This is Judah. That's Gath. It's a Philistine city. And, and this is taken, this isn't a zoom camera. This is just, you know, um, if I'm standing there and this is what the naked eye can see. Uh, you're an Israelite 
tending your sheep, plowing your fields. You can almost hear the Philistines at Gath partying and having great weddings and everything. Uh, Archaeologists have found um, Canaanites during the time of David. And so there's a, a proposal that this is a Canaanite enclave, the excavation of Beth Shemesh. And we have a pocket of Canaanites still living during the time of, of David. And what's unique is if we map out Joshua's battles with the south, we see he leaves the whole area here. Uh, the king of Gezer comes down and helps out Lachish. But all the battles are down in the southern Shrela. There's no battles in the northern Shrela. And archaeologically, we find, we know why now. There is a strong enclave of Canaanites there. And so these persisted until just before the time of David. So this Shrela, this foothills area, becomes a debating ground. When the Philistines are strong, they take over this land. When Judah becomes strong, they take over. And so Judah only takes over in the 10th century. And so we can see this expansion there. And now I want to talk about, um, just end on this new discovery to illustrate this point. We now have some fortress cities of the monarchy. Uh, Kirby Kiafa. Uh, not mentioned in the biblical text. They'll say it's probably Sherarim. They'll try to find a... a a biblical city in Joshua Judges, but we don't know. Archaeologists never seen it. David doesn't mention it, uh, but it's one of these major cities like Megiddo, just like Gezer. Fortified casemate wall, except it's not a six-chambered gate. It's a two-chambered gate. And uh, pottery that dates to the 10th century. Uh, carbon 14 dating dates to the 10th century. And someone went and built this city in the middle of the foothills. It's not in any urban area. Uh, we have writing, this text there. And what's this little fortified city doing with text? Um, this was a major find. Uh, we thought we, had, we knew most of the major cities there. So here's the location of Kirby Kayafa. And naturally, Yossi said, Okay, this is a fortified city on the border of some kingdom. That kingdom has to be Jerusalem. And so they're building a fortified city down here on the border. Who, who's the border with? The Philistines. And this, this looks just right across from Gath, one of the major cities of the Philistines. This was so phenomenal, and it's like this, you know, this is David's city, it's a new fortified city, that critical scholars said like, no, uh, this is a fortified city of the Philistines. So the city's not sitting on a border protecting Judah from the Philistines, it's sitting on the border protecting the Philistines from, from David. Uh, the only problem is we don't have Philistine pottery there. And throughout this, the couple of days, I've been showing you Philistine pottery. We know what a Philistine site is. Finkelstein, who doesn't believe David was a great king, has to acknowledge, okay, Jerusalem is built in the 10th century. Okay, we have this fortified city. And he wrote an article saying, this fortified city belongs to Saul. And it's just like, okay, if you don't believe David exists, but now you believe Saul exists? You know, so, uh, and it's funny, he sent me a copy of the article. Uh, and it was co-written with another scholar. And I, I read the article, and I emailed back, you know, the other scholar. I go like, okay, Phyllis, uh, Israel doesn't believe David exists, but Saul is a historical figure. And he just does not want to say this shows David because of Jerusalem. Saul's up here that it has to be Saul. And he said, every archaeologist said, like, what's going on? This is, you know. Um, but again, somebody who, does, who has a theory and can't let it go. Uh, and so the trend's coming back. It, and so now this new excavation was being excavated while we're down the valley, excavating at Tal Gezer. Uh, the Tandy excavations under Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. 
Uh, they funded the excavation, supported the team, and now Lipscomb University will get the glory as we publish the results, but that's just uh, 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 typical Baptist. They set the foundation, and then, you know, Church of Christ gets the glory. But I don't, I'm go, sorry, I'm, I'm still talking politics here, as you can see, Kevin. Uh, this is a large site. I, I can give a whole lecture on Gezer, um, but there's two hills, Ireland Valley, city that Solomon fortified. We have a late Bronze Age patrician house. This was destroyed. Uh, we know we have good dating to it. We have um, scarabs and uh, seals dating to the 13th century, uh, Egyptian influence. We know who did this. It's Murnepta. Uh, he brags about it. And we found um, actually three bodies in here. And so we're getting them. At one, two of them were so badly burned that we couldn't um, reconstruct them. And we just had the evidence and we had pieces of bone. Um, I told you this. Right? Yeah. Uh, after this, we have three layers of Canaanite cities. Um, we have transitions from domestic becoming a, a, a cultic site. We have Philistine pottery. A small percentage, one of five percent. Most Philistine sites will have like twenty-five percent of this decorative pottery, what we call tableware. You know, pieces you would put on your table, jugs, uh, salad bowls, etc. And you know, kind of like your nice china. And so you want to say we're good Philistines. So the nice china you put, you know, you, you decorate it. Um, there's this one text. David goes to war. With the Philistines, he chases them out of the hill country and says, So David did just as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. And so, somehow, when the Philistines get to Gezer, which is a Canaanite city, they feel comfortable, they feel safe. And now we know it. There, there was some type of relationship between Philistines. Either we had some Philistines living there, or there were some uh, exchanges. But the Canaanites protected them, and David realized, okay, I can't conquer the city. Um, we're done. Uh, as I said, it becomes a cultic city. This city is destroyed. And um, we have a, a, a simple uh, find. It's a stopper. You have store jars. You have grain. You have wine. You want to protect it from the rats. What do you do? You just take mud, clay, and you just pop it on top of that store jar. And they, they become mushroom-shaped. This is the top of it, and that's what just kind of sticks to It's kind of like a cork. And these are common. Uh, we don't even analyze them. We collect it, and, you know, we can count them and see how many were sealed. We threw them in, our, in a cardboard box in our storage facility, waiting for some Ph.D. student to do it, because we weren't going to do it. Article comes out that some of these have seals on them. And so my co-director, Sam, goes in the storage in the closet, pulls out our data, and sure enough, we find one of these with the seal. This article by Stefan Munger, a, a German uh, scholar, expert in these seals, has postulated that this is a campaign by Siamon. Now, I'm going back a little. Remember this pharaoh who gave Solomon, who conquered Gezer and gave it to Solomon. This pharaoh was probably Siamon based on the chronology. And so now we have a seal dating to Siamon that connects with the pharaoh that gave it to Solomon. As I said, this city was destroyed, and the next city on top of it is this massive fortified city that's mentioned in 1 Kings 6. And this was already found earlier. I told you my doctor father, uh, uh, Bill Deaver excavated this. We came and we excavated next to it, and what we found is a large administrative building. I would find to the 10th century. We can look at some of these other palaces and find out that it's these typical courtyard um, type of structures. We have some central courtyards and rooms built around it. And this administrative city was destroyed. Everywhere we found massive destructions, uh, just toppled um, stones. It took us two to three seasons just to remove the stones systematically. And I kept telling students, 
this is a massive destruction. Once we remove the stones, we're going to find the archive that we're looking for, or we're going to find a lot of goodies. This, this, as an archaeologist, this gives a window uh, that this was not removed. Uh, we know who did this. Um, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishai, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. To get to Jerusalem, you have to go through Gezer. Um, we might have Shishak's and Shishank's list. We might have the name of Gezer there. It's just um, eroded away, so we're not sure. And on, by the way, when we removed these stones, we only found like five or six things. It appears that the governor of Gezer knew Shishak was coming and cleaned everything out. Um, and it was just pretty much pristine. Nice, you know, paved floors, nice um, uh, sealed floors, but no, nothing that said Solomon was here. I love Solomon, or, you know, <laughs> I'm voting for Solomon. On top of this, it, the city changes. Domestic buildings are built on top of this public space. And these domestic buildings are not Israelite four-room houses that I showed you. Israelites are no longer living at Gezer. And so, pulling it together, reading between the lines, this reconstruction is not mentioned, but we take the biblical text. We know David and Goliath, the Battle of Baal Perazim, and a reference to Solomon's western fortress. David and Goliath fight in the Elah Valley. This is where this major battle occurred. Okay, the Philistines are on this side. David's over here. Bethlehem is just right over here. David comes and brings some sack lunches to his brothers who are in the front. And we know the rest of the story. Boom, the head. Uh, Philistines come up. David is united. And now we move from uh, through, through the books of Samuel. Uh, Abner brings the northern tribes. You know, he was under Saul to David and Hebron and says, okay, we'll re reunite with you. And all of a sudden, the first thing they do is Jerusalem becomes a capital. What do the Philistines do? Okay, if, if these tribes are united, they're powerful. They're becoming a nation state. They immediately march up south of Jerusalem to the Rephaim Valley and have a major battle. Uh, David expels them, become a second time. David expels them. This time they run up north and down to Gezer. So there's the capital. This is the march of the Philistines, right when David becomes the new king of uh, both the north and the south. Uh, we think we have an Iron Age fortress here. That David, It says David went to the fortress. And this is probably um, Gilo where he went to. I have to leave that out. All of a sudden we have a fortified city built here, Kirby Kayafa. Not mentioned in the biblical text, but you put the layer of the Bible. After two times the Philistines come up and get just south of the, of the capital, David says, you know what? I'm going to go build a fortified city here and stop them from coming up into the territory. I'm going to place it right here on the border. And this is the same valley that we had the Philistines fighting Saul with. Uh, it's the wide valley. It's easy to get up to. Uh, not mentioned in the biblical text. But you can see, we take the Bible, we take the archaeology, we start putting it together. Um, after David, Solomon becomes a little bit stronger. And what does Solomon do? He builds a fortified city. It's um, Tal Gezer, uh, you know, better map. But anyway, this is the border. And now all of a sudden, Gezer is off the map here, and the border expands westward. And under Solomon, we have the greatest kingdom. Uh, all right, here's the map here. So there's Kirby Kayafa, there's the border, here's Gezer. So you can see Solomon's already expanding his territory, not just the Elah Valley, but this wide Ireland Valley that actually takes you to the one port out around the Tel Aviv area. Um, and we have the expansion of the kingdom of David. And so uh, just to illustrate, I want to give one case study of how archaeology fleshes out the biblical text. I call it reading between the lines. Uh, the Bible doesn't record everything. It doesn't mention Kirby Kayafa. doesn't say, you know what, David got smart and built a fortified city there. 
But when we start placing the archaeological evidence, when we start placing the biblical texts, we can reconstruct this history, and I, I can talk, look at this border going north to south. After Solomon, it doesn't even come to Caiapha. It goes up to the hills. Rehoboam builds fortifications, and we can tell that by then, J- Judah is weak. Uh, extra biblical evidence, we have the Taldan inscription. We might have one in the Moabite stone, and actually we have the Menephtah one. Uh, so was David a king or shepherd chief? Are the stories of David fairy tales? No. Uh, my deductive reasoning, there was a crime. Uh, massive centralized authority was developed in the 10th century. These are the logical culprits. You can come up with another historical figure, another name. Uh, Israel Finkelstein's doing that now. He's calling it Saul. And it's just like, well, choose between Saul and David. I think he just might be David. Uh, does it matter? Uh, Yes, went to me as archaeological data, but Christianity is unique. We're a faith based on God acting in history, a historic faith. We're not like other faiths that it's, it's a set of principles or presuppositions. Uh, and I'll just leave with this. Who's the king in your life? More if I tell you that the Lord will build a house for you when your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took him from the one who was before you. And here we have the prophecy of uh, the Messiah will come out of the lineage of David, and there's going to be a new king that's going to rule not just the southern Levant, but um, the world. And so um, uh, thank you all for uh, putting up with me. Uh, future research, we need more archaeologists and more Bible scholars. So um, if you get tired of the code, Nashville is a beautiful place. We have an MA in archaeology. Uh, feel free to come down and uh, uh, we take all ages uh, as long as your Canadian dollars are good. So, that's, uh, so uh, thank you all for, you know. <laughs>
the tribal groups are still important and so they're there politically. Uh, even when somebody, you know, a politician, it's usually somebody from the tribe. Um, but I, I think some of the, the names are taken from Egyptian um, administrative texts. Uh, but that's for those who do, you know, biblical languages. But I've read some articles where they propose that, you know, um, the names that he's using over the, the administrators are good Egyptian names. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Typically, it has always been, at least in my understanding, that an argument from silence is not a very strong argument. Is that not true for archaeology? Uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, uh, like, like any data, um, uh, if we don't find, like if I want a site and I don't find anything, I don't say, uh, the example earlier, this, Jericho. It's like, okay, it's silent. We don't find the wall. Um, uh, but I assume there was a wall there. But somebody else can say, well, there's no wall, so, you know, therefore we have to conclude that it wasn't there. It's like, okay, every city had a wall around it, so I, I think this is a reasonable assumption to think that it was a fortified city. So, so it, it's case by case, I would say. Yes, sir. There, no, there's no book. Um, I have three or four papers because I always challenge my students. Somebody has to write a dissertation. Um, and everybody comes up with a different order of, of the judges. Uh, based on the archaeology, um, the northern area was probably the earliest area, you know, like Debrum, Barak, uh, Gideon. And then toward the end, you have, you know, um, uh, the judges with the fighting the, the Philistines, Samson like that. And by then that's, you know, when you politically were uh, Philistia and Judah are growing. And so you have more border tensions. So I think, you know, we can kind of see archeologically which one of the earlier judges and which one of the later judges. But no, you also have the Septuagint that has judges in different orders also. So there's a whole more complex Issue. So there might be a, a, a memory of the Septuagint having a more accurate chron chronology versus the Masoretic text that we're, we're putting it under. But I, I look forward to you coming and studying and <laughs> writing that book. So, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> if you open your mouth, you have to, you know, own it. So <laughs> we'll see you there. Okay. Yeah. Right. 206 years, three months, and 10 days. So, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 200, give or take. The, the Iron Age won archaeologically. I mean, we, we can't get absolute uh, calendar dates, but somewhere in the 13th century, the end of the 13th century. Um, and, again, it's um, Mernaptha's Israel, where, where are they? So if they're already in the land, depending which, you know, 1225 or 1207, which higher local Egyptian chronology, I'd say then, okay, then they're in the 13th century. But I, I think that because Israel's still a people, they're still doing their 40 years wandering. And Mernetha catches them on the way up. And so then I can say, okay, so after, you know, 1225, 1207, you know, they come in the land. So, you know, like 2000 to 1000 when David. Some texts try to take the, uh, the length of the judgeships listed in Judges and put them together, and they end up with 400 years. But they probably had but several judges yeah. at the same time. Oh, yes, a lot of overlap and also, um, you know, symbolic numbers, you know, some 40 years and like that. So. What's interesting, I, I read earlier about um, uh, Joshua living to 110. That, that's an Egyptian, a long life is 110. 
And so there's still a remnant of these Egyptian, you know, ages. Like if you want to describe somebody, you know, he lived a good life. We say 110, it's kind of like a, just a phrase. It's not a, you know, exact number. Back to the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for your kindness to us, for your goodness, for the blessings that we receive uh, day by day, um, even unexpected ones. Uh, we thank you for uh, bringing uh, Dr. Ortiz to our school and the blessing that he's been to us. And uh, we just want to commit him back to you and ask your blessings upon him, that as he returns to his home and to his work, that you would go with him, that you would protect him, and that your hand of blessing would be upon him and his family and his ministry. And we thank you once more for uh, all that we've learned. Uh, Lord, may we apply it not only to uh, our minds, but to our lives as we seek to live faithfully uh, in following Christ. And it's in his name that we say this prayer today. Amen. Amen. And you're dismissed.